Hello, everyone, and welcome to the lunchtime webinar. Uh, my name is Elise Shadler, and I am the Technical Assistance Coordinator for the Vermont Urban and Community Forestry Program. We are a joint program of the Vermont Department of Forest Parks and Recreation and UVM Extension. Before we get started with the webinar, I just wanted to go over a couple of things about the GoToWebinar tool. As participants of the webinar, uh, you are going to be muted during the presentation, but if you have a question, you can go ahead and write it in either the chat box or the question section of your GoToWebinar sidebar. We're going to keep track of the questions throughout the duration of the webinar, and we'll address them at the end of the session. Session. So we've left about 15 minutes at the end that we can strictly talk about your questions. Um, since there are multiple presenters speaking today, we ask that you bear with us during transitions. Uh, we are recording the webinar today, and we will be posting it to our website's webinar archive in the next couple of days. So you can keep a lookout for that if you wanted to share the webinar. And finally, you will receive a link to a short survey in your email after the webinar is over, and we would appreciate your feedback about the webinar um, through that survey. Okay. So, um, to kick us off, today I'm going to give a brief overview of Emerald Ash Borer in Vermont. Andy Hillman will follow with lessons learned from over a decade of working with towns in New York State to manage for emerald ash borer. Next, Jeff Beyer, who is Montpelier's Parks and Trees Director, will discuss Montpelier's planning processes and the strategies that they will implement now that EAB has been confirmed in our capital city. And I will wrap up the webinar with a tour of the resources that our program has developed and also we'll give some um, takeaways. And then Danielle Fitzko, who's our program manager, will facilitate a Q&A session at the end. Um, with that, I'm gonna start with an emerald ash borer update. This is the emerald ash borer. It is a one half long inch green iridescent beetle, originally from Asia, that feeds on all species of ash trees. EAB was confirmed in Orange County, Vermont in February of 2018. The focus of this webinar today is on municipal planning and management strategies for EAB, and we don't have too much time, so we're not gonna be reviewing the life cycle of the pest or the history of the pest, but we encourage you to visit vtinvasive.org if you would like some more information on the pest itself. I will say, however, that the reality is that the majority of ash trees that are infested with EAB will die. It spreads very quickly. It's a pest that is difficult to detect because of its size, and eradication of EAB is not expected. Your screen's not showing. Okay, now it's showing. Sorry about that. Let me go back to the picture of the pest. Okay, here. Here is EAB. This is the this is the pest. Okay, so this is our current um, North American extent of the EAB infestation. There are 34 states and four Canadian provinces that are um, currently infested, and you'll notice that every red dot on um, this map is a confirmed infestation site. In Vermont, here is the extent of um, EAB in our state. This is what we're kind of calling now the egg yolk um, or the double egg yolk. Um, the EAB infested area, which is what, what this uh, map is showing, includes both areas that are confirmed infested area and also high risk areas. So the red part of the map the confirmed infested areas are within five miles of a known infestation. It is likely that EAB is present now in much of this area. The known infestation sites in Vermont so far are Montpelier, Orange, Groton, Plainfield, and Barrie. Those are our, the five towns. Um, the five high-risk area or the high-risk areas, which are the 
the yellow areas, extend five miles from the outer edge of a confirmed infested area, and EAV is likely expanding into and may be present in some of this area already. This map is, is updated in real time and is available on vtinvasive.org and is also available on the ANR Atlas site. The EAB infested area layer is under the FPR uh, Forest Parks and Recreation tab in the ANR Atlas. So this allows you, if you'd like to explore a little more, um, to overlay this infested area over um, other layers like parcels or roads. The state of Vermont decided to adopt a statewide quarantine instead of a county by county quarantine. So we have joined the United States Department of Agriculture's 31 state federal EAB boundary. This means that all ash in Vermont are within the federal EAB boundary area. The quarantine will help reduce the movement of infested ash wood into uninfested regions outside of Vermont's borders. Moving ash material outside of the federal EB quarantine from Vermont to Maine, Rhode Island, or five counties in New Hampshire without a compliance agreement can result in penalties. Although we have adopted a statewide quarantine, we are directing efforts and making recommendations to slow the spread of EAB within the infested area. EAB infestations naturally spread about one to two miles annually, but we know that movement of infested material, especially ash firewood and logs, results in faster and wider spread of EAB. Carefully planning and managing the movement of infested or potentially infested material will slow the spread and provide greater protection for Vermont forests. Um, the state has released a suite of recommendations on slowing the spread of EAB, and these are all available on vtinvasives.org, which we'll go to later in the webinar session. Um, there's detailed information in this suite for forest landowners, for arborists, and tree care companies, and specific guidance around ash processing options, as well as insecticide treatment options, and moving ash from the infested area. So we're all here to learn about municipal planning for EAB. We estimate that about 5% of Vermont's forests are made up of ash trees, but green ash in particular has been a very popular street tree choice for the past couple of decades. It's a tree that has nice form, it grows fast, and is very tolerant of many urban conditions. So we know that some Vermont towns have a public tree population that is more like 20 to 50% ash. Additionally, ash is a species that grows really well in disturbed soils, like along rural roadsides. So we know that many of our back roads are lined with ash as well. We are now <laughs> encouraging all Vermont communities to plan for how they will manage EAB. And I'm just gonna run quickly through five reasons why we think it's important to plan. The first reason is that municipalities will be bearing the responsibility and the cost of removing and or treating public ash trees, as well as any subsequent replanting efforts after EAB comes through. At this time, there is no federal or state funding for EAB management. In fact, the federal government is planning to deregulate EAB as an invasive pest within the next year. Number two, dead and dying ash trees along the public right of way and in public places like parks and schools, pose a significant risk to public safety. Towns are gonna to need to respond and at a minimum will need to remove hazardous trees to address this risk. Number three, how can you manage what you don't know you have or you don't have? Um, here's an example. Uh, we've worked with about 30 towns in the past couple years all over the state to do downtown street and park tree inventories. When EAB was first detected this winter, I was able to go through that inventory data to get an idea of the impact that EAB is gonna have on our downtown ash trees. Berry City has just about 15 public ash in their inventory of about 500 trees total. So for Berry City, EAB management, management is gonna be pretty straightforward. However, about 50% of the downtown village trees in Stowe are green ash. So Stowe knows that there will be a substantial impact on its canopy downtown. Because these towns have have engaged in a survey of it, an inventory of their trees, which is a crucial part of any planning process. Um, they know that they're going to what they're going to be dealing with when the pest comes. Number four, 
By planning and being proactive, you can be strategic about the timeline for response and how your costs may be spread out over time. You can be thoughtful about how you want to manage your ash tree population instead of just reacting to the immediate need. If you plan for EAB, you may realize, for example, that it might be more cost effective to treat your high value ash trees in good condition with insecticide um, than just to remove them. And number five, EAB planning can engage and catalyze your citizens. Going through a planning process will allow the public to be involved and demonstrates that your municipality cares about its trees. As you likely know, people can be very passionate about trees and if they are informed about the problem, they can participate in the planning, they can participate in the ash inventories, and they can be involved in making decisions about management. Most of the community planning preparedness efforts that we have so far um, been in, involved in in Vermont towns have been initiated by passionate, engaged citizens, and we can see that continuing into the future. But ultimately, there has to be buy-in from the town because the municipality is going to have to make decisions about funding and budgeting for any kind of management strategies. So with that little planning overview, I'm going to present our first presenter for the day. Um, Andy Hillman is the Northeast Regional Business Developer for Davie Resource Group. As a senior consulting urban forester, Andy has assisted municipalities, engineers, highway and public works departments, universities and nonprofit organizations to develop and implement community forestry projects including tree inventories, urban tree canopy assessments, tree management plans, and tree preservation plans. Andy has 32 years of experience in urban and community forestry. Prior to, prior to joining Davie Resource Group, he was the city forester for the city of Ithaca. He is an ISA certified arborist, municipal specialist, holds the tree risk assessment qualification, is a New Hampshire certified arborist, a New Jersey licensed tree expert, and an instructor at the Society of Municipal Arborists Municipal Forestry Institute. So I'm going to quickly change the presenter over to Andy. And Andy, good morning, you're good Elise. to go. All right, thank you, Elise, and good morning, everybody. Or no, I'm sorry, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm I'm going to talk to you today about uh, my experiences with EAB. It's been um, it's been quite a while coming, and I'll get into that. But basically, I've been thinking about it and um, working on policy about it since 2003. So I want to give you some of my personal experiences. And um, I was walking through Salem, Massachusetts uh, earlier this year, and it was early in the morning, and I, I walked by this um, wood-fired pizza place. And there was a, a pile of wood that had just been dumped out in the street. There wasn't much traffic going on. And I'm an old wood burner, so, uh, you know, I was real curious just to go over and look at the wood. Can't help myself. But as I got closer, I, I saw that right on top there was ash with clearly was signs of EAB infestation. And EAB had not been confirmed in Salem um, at that point. So uh, I got... It turned out that this firewood actually came from New Hampshire, or at least from a big New Hampshire firewood operation. And uh, wood-fired pizza places generally use kiln-dried wood. And the, this this uh, emerald ash borer had exited a long time ago. So it probably wasn't a big deal, but it was just a, a reminder that this is how these pests move around very often. And I'm not going to show you a lot of pictures of VAB, but uh, I just uh, around here, and I think in many of your neighborhoods, EAB emerges about the time that the black locusts are flowering. So it's a it's a good way to um, to look for the EAB. Good way to notify yourself that they're coming out. In up until this year, emerald ash borer had not been uh, detected or confirmed in Vermont, if I'm correct. But if you look at this map, there's no surprise that, that Emerald Ash Borer was there and probably been there for quite a while because you're surrounded. It's been confirmed in all these states all around you and uh, up until 2017. So it's pretty widespread. It, 
it took it about 12 years to get from Detroit to Boulder and from Detroit to Boston. So it spread relatively quickly, mostly through um, people moving it. So I, I, my background is public works. I've been uh, in DPW for a long time. And, and uh, we used to have a motto that we've been doing so much for so long with so little that now we're qualified to do practically anything with nothing. So this is what I imagine a lot of you are asking yourselves. What are we going to do? And what do we need to know? And what's our going to be that strategy? Um, plus, uh, well, there's there's a rush on this. So it's um, we've seen it coming for for 15 years, but really, until it gets on your doorstep, often it's hard to get motivated to start uh, preparing. But that's what we need to do. And and soon the problem will be um, big and costly in Vermont. And so at least mention some of these strategies. And this is a nice little table that basically lays out uh, different strategies. You know, the no action is not an option for us in public works or in highway departments because um, as far we're not as worried about getting sued as we are concerned about public safety. So, uh, you know, you can see that uh, the aggressive um, is is um, max has maximum ash, ash protection, but nobody can really afford that. At least not a lot of us. I questioned the tree warden from Brookline, Massachusetts a few years ago about why he was still planting ash trees and that his name is Tom Brady actually and um, he just said well we'll treat we'll just treat them. So I, I wish I had Brookline's budget. I never was that lucky. But the selective method where we might gradually remove trees, you know, use chemical controls and um, keep the trees that, that are high priority. So what ash trees are high priority? I used to tell people that if if there's a, a black ash in good condition and it's outside a, a nature center and there's a kiosk there that explains the importance of black ash to Native American basket weaving cultures, that's obviously one you, you save and, and treat. Then you've got this other nasty green ash in a narrow tree lawn. And it's underneath the power lines and it's been um, doing air quotes, pruned by the utility company over the years. You know, that one goes. Everything else is in the gray area and it, it matters about what, what your budget is, how many ash trees you have, and, and uh, things like that. So again, no action. You know, we're not even going to look. Um, this is this is probably not anything anybody wants to do. The selective management is um, something I recommend, where you know you monitor your high value ash trees, you use chemical controls to maintain them, and try and remove ash trees and replace them gradually with non ash species. Preemptive management is where these uh, ash trees are removed preemptively. And we saw this happening in states like Ohio as emerald ash borer progressed eastward. And we're lucky that we can learn from the mistakes of states that were infested earlier than we were. So uh, option D is that aggressive management. And this is most expensive option, but it protects all, all your ash resources. Again, I don't recommend this unless you have a, a lot of money like Brookline, Massachusetts, it's not going to be an option for us. So here's the story. I took this picture yesterday in Ithaca, New York, and around, around 2002, 2003, I went in with Cornell, the Cornell Arboretum was called Cornell Plantations back then, and we got a whole bunch of really new, really cool ash cultivars, cultivated varieties, such as this one. This is um, urbanite, and it's a, it's a hybrid ash. But I planted purple applause and 
autumn purple, you know, all these beautiful white ash trees, several species of, I mean, cultivars of green ash, planted them all over the city. And that was just before emerald ash borer was identified. So this row of um, beautiful urbanite ash trees is still there. Just shot this yesterday, as I said, and there's a plan in place. Let me just go back real quick. Um, so back again, backing up in 2002, Ithaca hosted the Society of Municipal Arborists annual conference and trade show. And a couple of friends of mine were foresters in Detroit and Windsor, which is probably you all know is ground zero for EAB. That was where it was first discovered. And they mentioned that ash trees were dying mysteriously. The next year it was uh, identified as emerald ash borer, which isn't a big pest in China in its native range, but it, it was soon to become a huge pest here. So immediately, the Shade Tree Advisory Committee, which is led by Dr. Nina Basic, the city of Ithaca is very lucky, uh, came up with a policy, with a moratorium. We're not going to plant any ash trees for a little while and see what's going on. It became pretty apparent within a couple of years that Emerald Ash Board was not going to be contained. And so we had a permanent uh, moratorium, no planting of any ash trees. So last time an ash tree was planted in Ithaca as a public tree, was around 2003. Immediately we started seeing site plan review where uh, people were coming in with plans and they were planting ash trees all over the sites and so we outlawed uh, planting ash trees and any in like say development parking lots things like that. So we had probably the first EAB policy in, in New York and one of the first in the country but it was mainly just uh, let's stop planting ash trees and wait, see what happens. So um, I'm going to jump a little bit here and talk about why it's important to address the ash trees right away, very quickly. And and one of the things is this research that was done at the Davy Institute several years ago about the material properties of ash trees after they're infested by emerald ash borer. And uh, so Dr. Anand Prasad um, started breaking apart ash trees, some that were infested, some that weren't infested, and he had too much fun doing this probably. But what he determined was that ash trees be become very brittle for a couple of reasons after they become infested. And this is important to uh, municipalities, highway departments, and everything because you may be removing ash trees, and it's important to understand that things like this, dead ash trees, you know, shall not be climbed. That's our po company policy. This is actually a, a photo of Davy workers um, a few years ago, I guess. We were the first company to use pickup trucks. So don't climb them if they're dead. And if the two thirds of the canopy is, is dead from emerald ash borers, they shouldn't be climbed. That gives us a little bit of wiggle room. Tie in points become a, a problem. So if two thirds of the canopy of an ash tree is dead, you're going to remove it. I strongly suggest you use an aerial left to do that. Again, uh, no shock loading. So, you know, shock loading is if that branch was tied to a rope and as, a, as it fell, it swung back in and hit the tree, that's shock loading. And we've seen uh, really unfortunate cases where the whole tree just collapsed. It just broke apart and people, anybody tied in uh, was, was hurt or, or killed. And, and so, again, we have to be really, really careful about climbing in trees and removing the ash trees, and we have to keep an eye on them for public safety. If, if we can, we want to just fell the entire tree if, if it's uh, possible to do that. So, um, some conclusions and uh, uh, sort of halfway through the presentation, but I'm talking about some conclusions already. 
the trees can be protected, like that white or that uh, black ash out in front of the nature center that's uh, in really good condition and on a good site. If you save some of your ash trees by treating them, you can reduce your annual costs if you're going to eventually remove them. And if you wait too long, you're going to turn into a salvage operation and unnecessarily risk uh, the public. So I took this picture in Ithaca yesterday again. And oh, let me back up a little bit. EAB was discovered in Ithaca almost exactly the same time that it was confirmed in Vermont. So all around us, Emerald Ash Borer has been found, Syracuse and Binghamton, you know, south of us and north of us uh, quite a while ago but it just hadn't showed up in Ithaca. And part of that, I believe, is because uh, we like to say Ithaca is centrally isolated. There are no highways. No, We're one of the few municipal um, centers, or metropolitan centers, not served by the interstate system. So I think that's helped protect us for a while. So this is a, a, a green ash that, um, had a rip out recently in it, had a, a narrow crotch, and you can see there was included bark up here. That fell apart. This is clearly not an ash tree that's a candidate for treatment. And as a matter of fact, there was a sign posted on this tree, and I was happy to see that. I've been retired from Ithaca for quite a while, but I, they're, they're in good hands with their new forester, Jean Grace. And I can see that they posted ash trees, they've girdled them and made trap trees for, for the ash trees. And if, if you've heard how this works, basically the, uh, the emerald ash borers can detect when an ash tree is stressed and it's easier for the larvae to um, infest that tree. The tree has lower defenses and they're attracted to it. So if you have an ash trap tree like this, yeah, the emerald ash borers will lay their eggs in there, and then you can you cut down the tree and chip it up and and remove those emerald ash borers from the population. This is another shot from yesterday that I took, and now you can see where it was girdled right here, about um, four feet, three and a half feet up from the from the ground, and all these branches laying around there. I'm not sure why they left them, but it might have been to help attract them. That's from where the ash tree ripped out previously, and it was that was pretty pretty recent in a high windstorm. So, uh, like I said, I planted a lot of ash trees, and and I can't believe how big they've gotten. I hadn't checked on these trees in a long time. Ironically, these trees are in an integrated pest management interpretive park. And, and these are beautiful urbanite ash trees. They were inch and a half caliper, probably cost 75 bucks when we planted them. And, and they're, they're just doing a lot of uh, work for the city as far as ecosystem services and benefits. And so these are definitely candidates for treatment. And you can see they've, they've put a tag on this ash tree in that row and all the trees in the row. And that is to help with record keeping for treatment and also for putting out treatment contracts, for instance, if they weren't going to do them in-house. Again, that beautiful row of ash trees. And so uh, my main point here is that if there's an ash tree in good condition on a good site, we should really consider treating it and keeping it. Someday this pest, something's going to happen and this pest isn't going to be uh, as, as bad as it is. And we'll want to have some good ash trees around for seeds. Ash trees don't, seeds, ash seeds don't freeze very well. So it's important to keep some ash trees to keep production of seeds and, and hope for the future. This this is a shot of that same ash trees, and you can see just a beautiful canopy. Um, when we inventory trees, we do a condition rating, and you know it's uh, excellent, good, fair, poor, dead, critical, dead. Uh, these trees are between good and excellent. I, I don't. I'm pretty stingy with my ratings. I don't call too many trees excellent, 
but these urbanites are, are between good and excellent. And so definitely want to, want to treat them and maintain these trees. So uh, as Elise mentioned, and we've heard before, it's, it's not just another forest pest. It's going to kill all healthy ash trees. Blue ash actually might have some resistance to it, or it's, it's not their, their favorite. You know, favorite is green. It sort of goes like green, white, blue. Um, there's a lot of other ash trees, of course, but um, within four or five years of infestation, they're all going to be dead. And so in Vermont, we're going to see de dead or dying ash trees real quickly if, if you haven't already. And this is a big safety hazard for us who are involved with public right-of-ways and municipal tree populations. You need a plan. It's, um, it's not too late. Hopefully you've got a plan or you've been thinking about it already, but it's not too late to make that plan. And it's all about what you're, what's appropriate for your community, what you can afford as to how you go about dealing with this problem. You want to treat it early. And um, uh, be, before it's detected, maybe, but in early, very early infestations, treatment can still be effective. So I belong to the Society of Municipal Arborists, and the SMA has produced a, a toolkit and I highly recommend you look at it. It's um, it's on their website, and I'll give you the URL right here. It's just Urban Dash Forestry, and uh, this is a this is a toolkit that could help you in developing your plans. I hope we have some questions later. I went through this pretty quickly, maybe a little bit quicker than I thought I was going to. But again, here's that toolkit and my contact information, andrew.hillman at davy.com. Great, thank you, Andy. Andy. Yeah, I'm gonna switch back over, and uh, switch back over to us. Um, okay, so next up, we've got Jeff Beyer. So Jeff is the director of Montpelier's Parks and Trees Department. He's also the Montpelier Tree Warden. Um, he has been working with the city of Montpelier for 37 years, and he works closely with the Montpelier Tree Board. And they have been uh, planning for EAB since 2013, and uh, now are transitioning from preparedness planning to active management of the pets. So Jeff, I'm gonna give you control and we will unmute mute you. Uh, all right, uh, thank you, Elise. Um, uh, all right, thank you, Elise. Um, let's see, yes, we uh, now have, um, EAB identified in town. We've been looking for the uh, past few years, but uh, it was uh, discovered by a state worker up at National Life, uh, luckily, and caught it fairly early. We have yet to see how far uh, and it has spread, but expect that it is in more areas in town. So now that it's uh, here, um, our years of preparation uh, that were really uh, thoughtfully done by uh, uh, one key tree board member, but uh, the tree board as a team has been um, been a huge and feeling like we have a, a grip of what to do next. And I want to I need to give a lot of credit to uh, John. Oh, I'm gonna I'm gonna hurt his name, but John Akalajic and uh, John Snell. I want to give particular notes to them. We have a great volunteer tree board that's a huge help here in Montpelier. Um, and actually, John Snell did most of this PowerPoint. Um, um, let's see, so being prepared. So what's the purpose of the plan to first uh, to figure out our vulnerability? What is the extent of our ash? Um, and also to provide a chance to, as you're doing this to maybe do some early detection and, and figure out where you can do that early detection. It also gives you a grip uh, if you do a complete inventory about how diverse your urban forest already is. 
uh, and where, where are spots where you can uh, prophylactically um, do plantings to make it more diverse. Uh, you can explore potential and pros and cons of, of uh, chemical treatments and where it would be most strategic to do those chemical treatments and, and then how it would help your budgeting or not to do spread out those costs um, instead of doing so many removals in one year. And then do budget planning. This, if you're prepared, you can do the budget planning of, okay, you know how many ash trees you have, what diameter they are, how much is it gonna cost to remove those ash since it's like a 99.7% loss rate for most towns that don't chemically treat. You can kind of figure out, get a pretty good grip on what those removal costs will be and then work with your uh, city council or town board to, to figure out how you're gonna budget for that. Um, you can seek a sense, assistance from folks who have experience like you are now and um, and then educating your citizens. This is a big hit, and not all not all the ash trees that are going to create a problem are going to be on public land that you can control. So educating landowners uh, in a variety of ways to identify them and understand the problem and to take measures will help you uh, keep your land safe in your town. So publishing the plan, finding different ways to communicate your plan uh, is helpful in educating folks and also maybe getting feedback on how to fine tune your plan. Uh, conduct the inventory and then estimating, getting an estimate from uh, on private properties. Um, now, this sounds like a lot of work and it's uh, probably might seem impossible for some towns with small resources, but uh, the, the term many hands make light work is, is powerful. Um, there's a number of people who care about trees, care about safety, um, and being able to enroll volunteers to get this information uh, can go a long way. Um, so in engaging public officials, how you educate your, uh, your city council or town board is, is gonna be key in you getting the support you need to do the job well. Uh, meeting with them, having good slideshows, good uh, clear talking points um, will go a long way. We also, being prepared, want to have a disposal site or a staging area, a marshalling area, uh, so where we can, where we as the town can bring the ash, but also private citizens can get rid of their ash that they cannot use. Uh, is that wood going to be for low-income folks? Do you have a way to make value-added um, products out of the ash? Uh, do you have a chipper? You know, what is your uh, do you use your school burn wood chips? What is the what is the way that you can get rid of that ash? So now that it's here, um, uh, how can you slow the mortality of your other ashes so that um, the city is safer and your not helping the ash move more quickly on to the next town to devastate the next town. So um, again, education, surveillance. Now, so first you, you find, you do the inventory, but then every year going back and looking at those trees. So uh, Andy talks, I think uh, I appreciated his talk about the different strategies, whether it's the do nothing or you, take everything out and um, both have high risks um, uh, and expenses uh, associated with them, whether it's shorter or, or longer term. And it is hard to keep an awareness, but again, if you have enough volunteers um, to keep their eyes on the ash, training them how to identify the ash and, and the symptoms with it, and then being able to do branch sampling with bucket truck or whatever to get a grip on your problem, that that can help you have a, a picture of how it's moving and then to remove hazards, uh, trees that are showing decline and then actually looking at that, whether those trees that are declining have the ash borer as well. So slowing it, our, our strategy, what we want to do uh, is to um, do what Andy talked about is doing some trap trees. How do you select a, a trap tree? 
Well, one way is to pick on trees that are relatively cheap to remove in a, in a not as risky area. A tree that you can drop without climbing it or bucket chuck is, uh, could be ideal. And it's not too far from the place that you know is, is um, infected. Um, so, and there's some non-early uh, ash borer trees that probably need to be removed anyway. Um, but the, those that are uh, have other hazards or clear needs. And one, one preparedness plan I highly recommend is uh, many towns with their stretched budgets are probably more behind than they are caught up with their, um, with their tree care. So pushing your tree, your, your council members to give you the support you need so you can catch up on your, uh, your plantings and your uh, current pruning and, and tree work so that you are prepared when the ash borer hits is highly recommended. So, and then um, many towns will probably lean towards uh, treating their downtown trees because it's a downtown tree's investment is, is so much greater and harder to grow trees downtown. And there's only so many trees that are salt tolerant. That was an easy pick for us to go there. And the impact from tr chemical treatments is lower as well. So and treatment can help spread costs uh, over a 10 year period. Uh, you might choose, so you don't have to remove too many trees at once, choose to treat a number of trees that you will eventually remove just to spread up your removal costs, depending on the number of ash trees you have in your town. For in Montpelier, um, uh, inventory found uh, that we did two inventories. One, uh, one inventory that was focused on the trees in the right of way found a hundred and a little over 150 trees uh, that were uh, determined to be in the right of way. Another inventory that wasn't paying attention to the inventory boundaries, but uh, trees, ash trees that would potentially impact the right of way um, by volunteers found 550 trees with the potential to have an impact on the right of way, if not necessarily in the right of way. So we're we're uh, we're regathering that information with some trained volunteers to get a um, an updated grip on the condition of those ash trees that were pre previously inventoried, and then select from those the trees that we will um, remove. Uh, um, or a tree. And this is the, um, the worksheet that the volunteers are going out with to uh, collect the minimum data to move us forward with, uh, with the diameter, only checking on trees greater than four inches, and then the GA stands for green ash, and the WA stands for white ash. So in Hubbard Park, one of the parks uh, that has a lot of older trees, <coughs> had uh, John Akalajic, um found 600 trees that had the potential to uh, uh, fall on a trail, as, as is in this picture here that he came upon when he was doing his inventory. Uh, so that's, yeah, 600 trees in, in one park and our, our major park. Well, there's a national life um, picture. So uh, sampling of 97 on, on private properties showed uh, 97 trees. Um, and then we extrapolating that data, we think that there's close to 3,000 trees um, in Montpelier on private property ash trees. Um, so how are, trying to have a plan of how we're going to work with uh, citizens to make sure their safety is assured as well as their neighbors is a, a task. And one of those tasks is to update the tree ordinance so that uh, we have um, authority to help protect uh, neighbors when we can. So looking at uh, costs, uh, Andy's, Andy's thing about uh, when you can remove a tree, uh, the, 
is a is a challenge uh, for us. You know, how how long can you wait? Do we have the resources to remove trees, to identify and remove trees quick enough so they don't become brittle and expensive? Uh, this is something we need to calculate as a town as we'd like to slow the progress of the ash borer and not help um, hurry it by removing things before they're um, uh, the advanced infection. So we're also, um, while well, estimating costs, we're also uh, going to be encouraging the council to establish a low interest revolving fund so property owners have the chance to remove trees uh, before they get expensive to remove, even if they don't have the money, and then be able to pay that back with low interest, interest loans. Um, so we're we're assuming if there's 550 trees that are impacting the right of way, that could cost us with an average of $800 per tree, about um, $500,000. So currently, the parks and tree staff uh, of two are responsible for 400 acres of parks, 16 miles of trails and um, and uh, about 2,000 street trees. Um, we're we're uh, expecting that we're going to need an increase in budget to be able to safely uh, handle um, the removal of these trees over the next 10 years. So removing hazardous trees, identifying early to slow the cost and, and then removing trees. Um, is, is what we are promoting. And then we're also trying to diversify the, the um, trees that are growing in Montpelier by identifying spots where we can plant a couple trees uh, that uh, nearby where we know a tree is gonna need to be removed. Uh, and we're replacing Poorly performing street trees, we're trying to, as we do so, improve those planting sites and add some more sites. And there's a nice picture and, uh, of a um, tree board member working with a group of uh, volunteers to plant a downtown tree, John Snell, who prepared this PowerPoint. And there on the right is our um, tree nursery, the tree board members are uh, working on um, planting trees in preparation for uh, and diversifying our downtown, our trees around town. Um, and we have this one tree board members that instigated this neighborhood planting program where uh, street by street they just kind of push a, uh, a, the opportunity to plant trees in the neighborhood. And then there's been a couple neighborhoods that we planted around 20 trees in. Um, and that's been a popular, uh, popular this last two attempts. Uh, so the goal, our ambitious goal, is to to plant two trees for every one that's removed, to keep our uh, town flourishing with trees. And then education: how can we uh, uh, educate? Uh, the, the council, the folks in power, and then private citizens um, to and then help them understand the economic value of trees and then uh, understand the benefits of managing for the long term and how using chemical treatments can help uh, moderate uh, the problem and maybe even improve the budget implications. And then in increase the budget to do this extra work and add some more trees downtown. Uh, that's the uh, other stuff I've already covered. Um, and the tree board and I have done have engaged schools about the benefits of trees. And there's something great about uh, kids uh, learning. And it often draws in parents uh, learning and neighborhoods learning as well, which is a, a wonderful thing and working with local utilities to help us when they see problems with ash and let us alert us when they identify um, uh, ash problems and local contractors as well. 
and then be in touch with other towns so that we can learn from each other. So this is an example of a, on a picture on the right of our remaining healthy elm tree that 99.7% uh, isn't all the trees. And um, we're certainly glad that no one prophylactically removed this elm tree. Um, so we, uh, we uh, I, I appreciate all the help from volunteers and tree board members in caring for these trees so that we have these treasures downtown and uh, and appreciate all the help in minimizing the financial and social and ecological impacts of the ash borer and uh, board members including John Snell who did this or have been open to questions and sharing information uh, that is the uh, short story great thank you Jeff I'm going to switch back over to me. All right. So thanks to Jeff and Andy. Um, those were both wonderful presentations and um, we're really appreciative that you can um, share your experiences and your insights from both of your roles in city, uh, city planning. So just to kind of recap a little bit about what our program is doing, um, we've developed a number of resources, which I'll, I'll show you on the websites in just a couple minutes. Uh, we have a planning worksheet. We have a slew of case studies about other towns that have done ash inventories and preparedness planning. And we have um, a bunch of sample plans up on our website as well that you can use as a template or just peruse at your pleasure. Uh, we are supporting ash tree inventories. We have three tiers of different inventory styles. One is a really simple paper-based roadside, uh, rural roadside ash kind of tally. So that's the survey option. Uh, we have a new mobile application that we're uh, using on rural roadsides that's map-based and intended for towns to be able to use on their smart devices or iPads. And then we have a more robust Tier three street tree inventory. So if you do have those downtown trees that you're interested in inventorying, we can help with that. Uh, we are offering direct technical assistance, particularly to all the towns um, within the infested area. And you can reach out to myself or Danielle um, if you're interested in talking more about that. We are doing a lot of outreach and trainings and public meetings. So um, we, along with staff at Forest Parks and Rec and the Agency of Agriculture, um, are kind of tag teaming on making sure people have plenty of opportunities to learn about EAB. And then our grants program, which we offer annually, will be entirely focused on Emerald Ash Borer planning and preparedness and management this fall. So um, if you're not signed up for our tree mail, um, it's a kind of quarterly email that we send out, and that would be a great way for you to stay in the loop with what's going on with our program, but also um, particularly about when our grants guidelines and um, deadlines will be published. Um, what we're hearing from towns is that, uh, you know, there's a lot of need for inventory and understanding their ash populations. and. Um, there's also a lot of need for public outreach support. So we do have some posters and materials that we can send uh, out, out to you and to your town clerk's office that um, would allow those kind of documents and resources to be available to homeowners or anyone coming in. So again, if that's something you're interested in, feel free to reach out. Um, we've heard that towns are interested in more of a flow chart or decision matrix. So um, that, just so everyone knows, that is something we are working on, um, taking our planning worksheet and kind of migrating it into a different format. Uh, towns are interested in exploring treatment and slowing mortality options, and Jeff really did a great job at talking about how Montpelier has worked through understanding how they want to use insecticide treatment and how they want to work with slowing mortality options. Um, Andy did a great job also at outlining these three management strategies, which are certainly not set in stone. There's a lot of gray area in between, but essentially your options are to do nothing, to do selective management, or to do aggressive management. Um, we know that towns are kind of thinking about what their staff capacity is and what their needs are for planning. So um, will tree removals be able to be done in-house or that 
Are those going to need to be contracted out to local arborist companies? Who are those tree care companies that you're going to work with? Um, those are all questions that, that municipalities are working through. And then uh, also you heard from Jeff around the idea of having a, having a spot where homeowners and the municipality can store the wood once um, trees are cut down. And if there are options locally for wood utilization, so um, are there local artists that could use the wood? Could you make the ash wood into park benches? Could it all be used for firewood? Um, or is it all going to be chipped and used for landscaping? So these are all things that municipalities should and are thinking about. Um, I'm going to leave you with four takeaways, and I think this is kind of just a summary of everything that's been presented in the webinar. One is that EAB is here in Vermont, and it will kill ash trees. It's a bleak message, but um, fortunately, it's the reality. Um, we encourage you to get a team together and assess your role and ability to manage your ash trees. Number three, it's going to cost something. So the sooner you can get the resources and a budget together, the better. This is uh, particularly in, uh, in awareness of the fact that budgets are typically approved in March for the coming year. So um, we want to make sure towns are really thinking about budgeting now so they can present something in March. And the last thing we want to leave you with is that there are many resources to guide you. So at this point, I just want to walk you through um, two, our two websites. Um, so the first is um, VT Invasive, which is the one-stop shop for, in, for invasive species information in Vermont. Um, and on this page, one important feature is this report it button. So if you think that you have found an EAB or if you have a suspected tree, um, you can upload a picture of the EAB here, um, and it walks you through pretty easily how to do that, and it also gives you some information about lookalikes, so um, you might be able to rule out that it's not uh, what you thought it was. Um, also on this page is a whole section on EAB, so I wanted to just bring your attention to this. There's extensive information about the quarantine, the, there's that infested area map, um, recommendations for slowing the spread, which I mentioned earlier. So you can check out here about um, this document about um, processing ash material, what the recommendations are, um, recommendations on insecticide treatment. Uh, this is also, a lot of this stuff is overlap and you can find it on our website as well. Um, and then there's information about how to identify ash and emerald ash borer. Um, there's some informational videos and slideshows, and then if you check out this resources section, it divides out resources by different audience. So if you're a homeowner, you can check out this guide to emerald ash borer. This is one document that we have printed off and sent to towns um, to, to be available at the town clerk's office. Um, just kind of goes through your process as a homeowner of assessing if you have ash on your property and what to do. Uh, there is, uh, again, this insecticide treatment document. Um, and then the, the other audiences we work with are forest landowners, municipalities, um, educators, and volunteers. So uh, this website has a lot of information and um, hopefully it's pretty easy to walk through. And then finally, I just want to walk you through our EAB management resources. So this is vtcommunityforestry.org. And we have a whole section on emerald ash borer management. Um, and we've got a bunch of resources here, but we kind of walk through the planning process. So figure out who your key players are, uh, do an inventory. There's a whole page on the different inventory options and support that we can provide. Here are those three levels that I mentioned, the rapid roadside, location-based roadside ash, and public the more robust public tree inventory. Um, then you have option to play around with budgeting. So there's a couple tools. The EAB cost calculator and the EAB management cost calculator are uh, not tools developed by our program, but um, tools out of the Midwest that can help you input local data to get an idea of, of what it's going to cost to treat or remove or replace your ash trees. Um, some recommendations for education, and then all these resources down here. So we have this management worksheet, which I mentioned, uh, which really walks you step-by-step step through 
uh, planning and managing EUB locally. Um, we have information on um, so some FAQs, which is a great thing to read through also. Many questions, as questions have come in, we've kind of filtered them through this uh, FAQ page. So hopefully there's some common questions that are answered there. We have uh, case studies that I mentioned earlier. So these are uh, nine towns throughout the state that have engaged in an ASH survey and might even have an EAB preparedness plan. So you can look at those case studies here, towns of all different sizes. And then we have examples of plans also listed down here. So again, um, everything from Burlington to Rutland to Johnson, um, different size and different types of towns that have, have plans and that you can use as a template or to guide your planning process. So with that, um, I think I'm going to hand it over to Danielle, um, and we're going to do some questions, answer some questions. Great. Uh, thank you, Elise, Jeff, and Andy for very informative um, information. <coughs> One moment. Let's see. Um, also, down at the bottom uh, of this slide, just so everyone knows as we're starting to go through questions. Um, both of those websites are listed, vtinvasive.org and vtcommunityforestry.org. Um, and then my email, Danielle's, Andy's, and Jeff's are included as well. So if you have specific questions um, <coughs> that aren't answered right now, we can we can get there. And it's great to get a little coughing attack right when you're about <laughs> to speak. <clears throat> so there is one question that came in that um, – I'm going to address right now, and then we can open it up so maybe Andy and Jeff may have more to add to it. And this is on the role of utilities in managing for EAB. Uh, we have already started to work with utility companies. Uh, we had a meeting a couple of weeks ago, and actually we have a meeting coming up this Thursday <clears throat> that will bring in a utility forester from out of state that has worked in EAB infested areas to talk to them about mitigation planning, which is very important. EAB uh, along utility lines is very costly, and utilities know that they will be needing to manage ash trees for EAB, particularly uh, hopefully before they die, because certainly, as Andy mentioned, the cost uh, is greater when you're removing dead trees, particularly when you have an infrastructure like a line. Um, you know, we, we did get some numbers from GMP that crosses over 202 towns in Vermont. So they have a really big service area. They estimate that their uh, ash tree composition is about 10.5% along their lines and that this impact could be between 100 and $200 million. So they are certainly planning and thinking about it. Uh, we will most likely see um, some preemptive cutting of ash trees in the infested area. Uh, utilities manage typically on a rotation cycle. So, for example, GMP typically comes in um, in more rural areas on a five-year cycle. Um, so they need to be thinking about uh, their management when they're in that area, and they may be more aggressive in the infested area. Uh, they are also committed to slowing the spread. Uh, they recognize that, uh, you know, they don't want to be contributing to the movement of EAB. But that being said, they may not be on the same timeline as the municipality. Um, if municipalities are calling them now, they're still developing their plan, so they're not going to be going out there and doing any sort of preemptive removals. They're, they're trying to think of their big picture. Um, but if a municipality did want to uh, do some removals in, or work on trees along the lines, I just put the caution out there that it's unique. It's, a risk to work around electrified lines if you don't have qualified workers. It's it's really a safety uh, issue. Um, so as we learn what the utilities plans are in Vermont, we will begin to share those out. Right now, we're not sure what the municipal uh, utilities are planning on doing. Um, but as I mentioned, we have a meeting on Thursday, and hopefully, we'll learn more. Um, I'm just reading a question here. Uh, is the state still using the EAB traps, and are they efficient in finding the bugs? So they um, they are still putting some traps out there. You're thinking of the purple traps, um, and that's 
actually is done by the federal government through APHIS. Um, I'm not sure how many are going out this year. There's a couple hundred that are going out. They actually find that they're not that effective at finding EAB. I think the track trees that um, Andy and Jeff talked about seem to be more effective. The state is using some track trees near and in the infestive area uh, on state lands uh, this year. But, but also in the city of Burlington, did purchase some other kind of trap, and Lisa knows more about yeah, that. They, uh, they're actually neon green instead of purple, but the city of Burlington, I think, bought 25 of their own, and they hung them around, or hung them from ash trees in poor condition throughout the city. So they're just doing what they can locally to be monitoring. It's not in Chinning County yet, so they don't feel that they need to go as far as doing trap trees. Um, but they are they are doing some local monitoring. Uh, we did have another question come in about the insecticide options for treating EAB, um, and I'll give an overview of that. So there are really three classes of insecticides that can be used to treat for EAB. Um, one of them is a class that are in the neonicotinoids, which I'm sure most of us have heard can have an impact on pollinators. Um, it, it just so happens that those products are also the ones that are available to homeowners, um, and they can be applied either by soil drench or by granule application to the soil. Um, and because of their impact on pollinators and because they're being applied via the soil, we are not recommending that homeowners treat their trees themselves, that they work with an arborist that has a pesticide license um, for shade trees and ornamentals. We're also not recommending that, uh, we, what we are recommending is that you do a trunk injection of a systemic insecticide for high value trees and high value locations. As Andy mentioned, there's a lot of gray area of what's high value and high value location. It's also based on your resources. But the, the two chemicals that fit into that category that are not a neonicotinoid are emamectin benzoate and azadiractin. Um, emamectin benzoate uh, has a, can be trunk injected and it can last two years uh, and sometimes even three years when the pest population goes down. It's very effective uh, on both the larva and the adults. Azadiractin, uh, is a by is a product of the neem tree um, and is effective on the larva. Um, in high populations of EAB, it's not as effective and it needs to be applied on an annual basis. Um, working with our agency of agriculture, our recommendation uh, is the emamectin benzoate uh, applied every third year in the spring. Just well, there, there was another question that came in, and maybe we should open um, the lines for Andy and Jeff to see if they have any yeah. additional comments on that. Can you do that? Yes. So. Utilities and. Oh, uh, go, briefly, okay, Andy, you're on now. Oh, okay. Thanks, thanks, Danielle. Um, when you're talking about utilities, one reason they have to do preemptive removals is exactly because of that cycle that you mentioned. They might be on a five-year cycle for pruning those transmission lines or distribution lines, and an infested tree might not uh, appear to be infested, but if they come back five years later, that tree could be dead. That's how quickly it could go. Early infestations are very hard to detect. As a matter of fact, we inventoried, uh, Davy inventoried a tree in Syracuse, an ash tree, and it had a purple prism trap in it. But we didn't find any problem with the tree or any infestation. A few weeks later, one adult was found in that trap. So unless you're up on the sunny side of the crown when the emerald ash borer adults are emerging and flying around, you're not going to see them in an early infestation. Um, barring uh, the, you know, you cut some branches and 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 uh, shave them to see if there are galleries in those 
upper branches. By the time you see it, an exit hole at eye level, it's way too late. Uh, Andy, this is a, a question that I have, and I'll uh, see if you what your opinion is on this. Is uh, can you share your experiences working with along rural roadsides and the approaches to manage for EAB when you when you have you know thousands of trees along the ro rural roadside? Yeah, yeah. Thanks, Danielle. Um, so. A, a windshield survey can be really effective with this, especially when the leaves are off. It's very easy to spot ash trees because, as we all know, they have opposite buds, like a, a maple. So if you see a tree that where the branching is, is opposite, in other words, the buds are on either side of the twig, it's going to be a maple or an ash or a dogwood almost, almost uh, certainly. And... And so if we can spot those ash trees by driving and doing a windshield survey uh, and map them that way, and any trees that are likely to fall into the right-of-way or are already in the right-of-way are, are candidates for treatment or removal. And very often in those cases, it's going to be removal. And have you seen different uh, strategies on any mechanized equipment coming in to remove trees along roadside, rural roadsides? Um, well, uh, uh, if you're talking about like those feller bunchers, you know, there's huge equipment yes. for removing trees. Um, I haven't personally had any experience in it, but if a lot of times the uh, utility companies have tracked. Uh, aerial devices so they can go into some pretty muddy rugged terrain and again one of the main reasons is you can't put a climber in those trees unless it's very early in the infestation so you're talking about homeowners this kind of relates to them too if they have a, an ash tree in their backyard maybe growing up through the center of a deck and, and you built a deck around it and it's really beautiful and shady those people have to make a decision very early on because uh, the options quickly go away. And so you can treat it or have somebody climb it and remove it. But if you can't get a bucket truck or a crane to it, once its uh, infestation reaches a certain point, two thirds of the crown, for instance, being missing, your options are pretty much gone. So it's, it's important to have a plan to consider your options early and act on it. Great. That's, a, I feel like, a great way to end, um, end the webinar on that last note um, plan. <laughs> uh, so thanks, everybody, for participating in the webinar. Um, like I mentioned, there will be a survey that will be emailed to you afterwards. And one of the questions is regarding uh, other topics you might be interested in or resources that you'd be interested in that we're lacking. So we definitely would love uh, your your opinion on what other things would help be helpful for municipalities. So thanks, Andy. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks, Danielle. And hope everyone has a wonderful day. Take care. Take care. Thank you. Have a good day.